You know, we have these, these pinnacle points, these high mountaintop moments of gathering together in the presence of God. I, I just couldn't shake what it must have been like again for those, those followers of Jesus on that Resurrection Sunday. And not just them, but what, what happened after that high point, like when it finally sunk in, the reality of what it was like. I started just reading through the scriptures and, and you know, uh, not stopping at the resurrection, but going on afterwards. And you get this beautiful passage in Luke 24 of where uh, you, you start to get this understanding of, of the followers of Jesus coming to the reality of why he did what he did and what it means to them and now what it means to us. And um, as I was researching and I was looking and just reading various articles, a guy called Mike Marsh wrote this part that just really stuck out to me in this concept, this idea. But there was these other things I want to share with you today in and around some of these thoughts of these early disciples now following after Jesus and the, 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 the newness because for them, uh, you've got to understand that this was a, a, a life-shattering moment to start with. And I want to say this morning in the story that we're going to read out together and we're going to look at, that I think you might find yourself in the story. I think you might find yourself there because if you've ever had your life shattered, if you've ever had your, your life fall apart, then you'll find it in this story. If you've ever had your life restored, you'll find it in this story. If you've ever been in those in-between moments between being shattered and restored, you're going to find yourself in this story. Because it's not a story that just goes over once in our lives, but tends to be a little bit on repeat. There's a pattern that describes the journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus and back to Jerusalem and even beyond that. And you'll be introduced to these characters, this guy called Cleopas and his companion take this journey, and a journey that each of us take. It's either going to be a journey you've already taken, or you will take, or you'll take again. However, the outcome is supposed to be the same. The, the good news about the risen Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to go out into all the world. That's, that's the point. So I'm not talking about Jerusalem and Emmaus this morning as, as geographical locations. I'm talking about them as representative realities in each of our own lives. They, they're portals into a, a greater self-awareness, if you like, a lens through which we see a greater fullness of God and ourselves, of each other and the world that we live in. There is a Jerusalem and an Emmaus within us and are both enacted out in our lives. Cleopas and his companion are with the 11 other disciples gathered together after the resurrection. We tend to think sometimes there's just these 12, right? But there's way more than just the 12. There's a whole, you know, all the larger crowd of Jesus' disciples, the followers, not, not the 12, but the rest of them that were part of the traveling band and party that would, would have given up the, the important things of their life to follow after Jesus. And here, Cleopas and his companion were one of those and they just heard the news of Mary and the other women who'd come running back from Jesus' grave empty and with the news that he isn't there that he's he's gone perhaps he's even risen and it's a really confusing time for everyone who's gathered there they're like what what did you say is this true is this untrue and unfortunately around about that time a woman's testimony didn't mean very much. In fact, they were, they were actually debating within the religious system, the Jewish religious system, whether a woman's evidence could be used as testimony in, in like a court proceeding process. To me, this just speaks to the actual truth of what was recorded. If you wanted to make this stuff up, if you were making it up in the first century, you would not record that women were the first to the tomb to come back with that evidence. 
because you would, you would write in, if you were wanting to make it up, you'd write in that men were there first because that was what was acceptable evidence at the time. But this isn't what happens, this woman, and to me it just speaks of, smacks of the truth. The truth that is there, that is, Jesus is no longer, but they are still in a point of confusion. They don't understand and know where he's gone or or what's happening. There is a a point of confusion. Mary comes back a little more assured after her meeting with Jesus than the others, but still, Peter runs off, and so does John, and they're confused. The rest of them are waiting, confused. You see, Jesus invited people to believe in him. Not just in his teaching, not just in a philosophy, not just in a cause, not just in an ideology. He called people to a personal faith, faith in a person, Jesus. And the response of his followers to his intensely personal call was to sacrifice everything in devotion to him. These were men and women who laid down everything, including their families, their futures, their livelihoods, their hopes and their dreams to follow after Jesus. They were the ones whose worlds were shattered when he died. They believed in him just like he'd asked them to. Now, not only was their master dead, but they've discovered early in the morning on the first day of the week that his body is gone. Talk about a life shattered. Luke 24, pick up verse 13. Now that same day, that same morning, that first day of the week when they found that was empty, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles, it's about 10 or 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stopped walking, they stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. And they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. We had the strangest lunchtime conversation the other week at church. We, we down tools together, we come out to the cafe area and we sit down and we bring our lunches out and we sit and talk about it. And someone said, uh, ever tried to run away from home? Like, well, I won't tell you which pastor it was. <laughs> they may or may not be looking after your children. <laughs> Have you ever tried to run away from home? And, and so the conversation started. And to my amazement, I, I've never tried to run away from home, figuratively speaking. I, you know, I, I get the image of the stick with the sack on the back and you've got your possessions, you know, your favorite teddy bear and whatever else, and you, you disappear trying to run away from home. And to my amazement, there were several people sitting around who said, oh yeah, I tried that when I was little. And I'm, I'm fascinated now, how long did that last? How far did you get? Where did you go? Oh, not very far, like the park down the road and 12 hours, like 12 hours later, like your parents must have just been flipping out, you know, a five-year-old gone for 12 hours or something. It's crazy. But I can kind of understand that sometimes you feel like you just want to run away. Have you ever felt that way? You just need to get away. 
I'm not just talking about a holiday. We all like to get away for a holiday. Just kind of running away from life. When you've been deeply disappointed. When you've lived with unmet expectations. When you felt lost and as if your world has been turned upside down. And you start wrestling with those kind of really big questions, you know, who am I and what's next and where do I go and what do I do? Can you remember maybe a time where you did everything right and still life didn't work out the way you planned or wanted or even thought God wanted? Has your life ever been shattered? Because that's what it was like for Cleopas and his companion. And we may run away in all manner of ways. It's not always with the stick over our shoulder and the sack at the end, you know, with our, our small amount of possessions in there. We can, we can run away. Sometimes it's a physical thing, but sometimes it's a, a mental thing. Sometimes it's a dependency and an addiction. Sometimes we run away mentally into ourselves or just away from others as we put up walls and boundaries. And we tend to want to run away from pain, and that's totally understandable. And Easter morning, first day of the week, these two disciples are leaving Jerusalem, and who can blame them? Jerusalem to them, right at this moment, right now, in all amidst the confusion, Jerusalem is a place of, a place of pain, it's a place of sorrow, it's a place of loss, it's a place of death, it's a, expectations and disappointments. It's where their lives have been now shattered. And no one wants to stay in that place. And as they walk, they're talking about the things that happened. I'm sure they're talking about the things that didn't happen. They're talking about Jesus' arrest and torture and his crucifixion and his death and his burial. Uh, they're probably talking about their hopes that didn't materialize, their expectations that were unmet, the investments that paid no return. And they're disappointed, they're sad, they'd hoped Jesus was going to be the one, in fact, because he called them to himself and they'd followed him and given up those things and they'd, they'd deeply invested into this personal faith in the person of Jesus. Now he's not only dead, he's gone, he's missing in action. What, what is happening? There was nothing going to keep them in Jerusalem. That wasn't the place they wanted to be. And he said to them, verse 25, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was in all the scripture concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going a little farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from sight. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why why they chose to go to Emmaus. Maybe it's their hometown. Maybe that's where they'd left in order to follow after Jesus, become one of his followers, his disciples. Maybe in following him, they'd left Emmaus behind and now they don't want to be in Jerusalem. They're going back home. What I do know is that there have been so many times when I just wanted to get away, when any place was better than the place I was in. Any place was better than a Jerusalem at that moment. And Emmaus is our escape from life, or so we think. What we don't know at the time, and what Cleopas and his companion did not know, that it's also a way back to life. That realization happened for these two disciples, as it does for us in the, the breaking of the bread. It wasn't an escape from life that took them 
from Emmaus, but a hunger for life. It wasn't brokenness that took them to Emmaus, but a hunger for wholeness. It wasn't the shattering that took them to Emmaus, but a hunger for restoration. They just didn't know it yet. See, hunger is so much more than physical, and we know that. It's spiritual, it's emotional, and, and we're, by nature, we're hungry. Hungry for these spiritual things, these truths. We hunger for life, we hunger for love and wholeness and community and meaning and purpose. And that hunger is the reason that they, they strongly urge Jesus, hey, stay with us. There's something about this guy, stay with us. And Jesus would not only stay, he fed them. And the guests they invited to their table became their host. And when he was at the table with them, he takes the bread, he gives thanks. And he broke it and he began to give it to them and their eyes were open and they recognized who he was. And he disappeared from sight. Now, apart from being a really cool party trick, you know, just to be able to disappear like that, the important thing is that they recognized him as the one who they'd left for dead <coughs> in Jerusalem. They recognized him as the the, the, the one who had accompanied them on the road to Emmaus. They recognized him as the one they had hoped he would be. See, the breaking of the bread, this symbolic perhaps of the, the Last Supper, although they weren't there and it was just the 12 of the disciples that were gathered there at that Last Supper, even though... It, it, they weren't there. It's, it's, it's true for them as it is true for us when we find ourselves restored by what Jesus did in the giving of his body and the, the shedding of his blood for us. See, Jesus wasn't giving them bread. He was giving them back themselves. That was the restoration that was happening. When Jesus broke the bread, something broke open in the spirit realm. Something broke open that revealed. Something became obvious about Jesus and what he had done and who he was. And with that breaking open, their lives all of a sudden looked like they were being put back together. And so it is for us. We've all had times when our lives feel that they've just been broken open in ways we could never imagine we could do for ourselves. And despite how it feels, brokenness isn't the ending. There's more to it than we often see or know. It's not just brokenness, a shattering. It's a break, an open to new life, a, a, a new way of seeing, a new recognition. It's a breaking open to community, to welcome, to hospitality, to love. Isn't that what we experienced last weekend? Isn't that our unspoken desire for the meals we share with each other? Isn't that what we experience when we have our eyes open to the sacrifice of Jesus and the giving of himself? Jesus fed them just not with bread, but himself, with his body, his life, his love, his compassion, his strength, his forgiveness, his hope, all that he is, all that he has is being given over to them. And they finally, in their being broken open, saw and recognized who he was. And then he disappears from sight. Where does he go? I don't know. Where do you think he went? Maybe. Is he abandoning them? Is he just playing a game of now you see me, now you don't? I, I don't really know. Was he about to undo everything that had just happened? No. See, he was no longer before them because now he was within them. Jesus burning hot in their hearts, right there within them. And it had been there all along. And sometimes that, that burning is felt as brokenness. Sometimes it's felt as hunger or being broken open. And other times it's deep joy and gratitude. But it's always Jesus. Listen to what it looks like in the following verses, 32 through 35. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? 
Even before they recognized who he was, there was that hunger that was being fed by the presence of Jesus in each of their lives. And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. They forgot that part earlier on. Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when they broke the bread. They got up immediately and returned to Jerusalem. They returned to the place of pain in which they'd come from. Jerusalem isn't only a place of death, but it's a place of life. It's not only a place of sorrow, it's a place now of joy. Not only a place of shattering, it's a place of restoration. And Cleopas and his companion, they, they arrive with their news of their Emmaus experience only to hear that Jesus was alive and seen and present in Jerusalem. We leave Jerusalem in order to return to Jerusalem, to face our deaths, our losses, our shattered lives. And in doing so, we discover that life really awaits us there because of Jesus. We return to reclaim ourselves in those places, to recover the lost pieces of ourselves. The city hadn't changed, but they had. Our Jerusalem may not change, but we do. Shattered lives, broken bread, this idea of Jesus giving himself for us, restored lives. Jerusalem, Emmaus, Jerusalem. That seems to be the pattern It's never easy. It's not simple like it sounds. It's one thing to name the pattern, but it's another to live it out. And it takes time, it takes effort, and it's painful. It's not easy. It means trusting that somehow the broken pieces of our lives will become the pieces for a new life, a new seeing, a new way of living. This here is a kinzuki bowl. Uh, Do you know what a kinzuki bowl is? This is one, I've got to be special, precious with it because it is not mine and the friends that have bought it to me, it's not even theirs, so. (laughs) Don't drop it, John. Uh, A kinzuki bowl is a Japanese form of art where the bowl's broken pieces are put back together with gold. And the gold actually makes the bowl stronger as it holds those broken pieces back together than it was before you. This one's a little difficult, beautiful bowl, difficult a little bit to see because of the, how the gold matches the color of the pottery there. You can see on the one up there just how uh, contrasting sometimes that can be. And here these beautiful artwork reminds us that the idea of embracing flaws and imperfections, you can even create a stronger, more beautiful piece of art. But that's kind of what we experience when we have Jesus, when we have his grace. Through his forgiveness, he brings us to a place of restoration. Our our broken pieces being glued back together with the gold of his grace. Holding it and becoming stronger. Even more beautiful than before. Even stronger than before. You see, in all three gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all end in a very similar pattern. Jesus appears to his followers, stands there and says, uh, you know, here, I'm the real deal. Here's the, here's the nail scars. Give me something to eat. Give me something to drink. I'm not a ghost. I am real. Look at me. Touch me. Feel me. He's reassuring them of his very real risen presence amongst them. And then he tells them the same things. 
He opens up their understanding to the word of God, showing them as he showed the ones on the road to Emmaus, how he fits into the whole story, saying, you can see now how it is written that the Messiah is going to suffer, rises from the dead on the third day, and the total life change through the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to all the nations, starting from here, starting from your Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the place of pain, on the opening and the breaking of the bread and the realization of his grace that pulls all our broken, shattered pieces back together again and makes us whole, brings us back to the Jerusalem, what was a place of pain, now to be a place of restoration. And it's from there that we go to the world to be able to tell people there's hope in your brokenness. There's hope in Jesus and by his grace, by his body and his blood and the forgiveness of your sins that can bring you, regardless of how shattered you are, back into something so beautiful, something so precious, something now worth so very much. Don't allow your broken pieces to be the end of the story. And go and tell the world there is hope. There's some empty seats next to you, I guarantee. Yeah, have a look. Too many. Because the, the world needs to know there's hope. And we, the ones who are in the midst of our brokenness, either we're on the journey to restoration or we're the journey out of brokenness or we're somewhere in between. We know that there's this going on in our lives and, and we still have this message of hope even though we're in hurt, we're in pain, we're suffering. We know there's restoration. There can come the joy. It's when our hearts burn within us that we have something to share with others. And we share what we've been experienced by being restored by Jesus. A continual process that you can hang on to in hope of what he's done that we just reminded ourselves on at Easter. And it starts when you're in your Jerusalem. Like I said at the beginning of this message, this is a a story is a pattern that describes our journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus and back to Jerusalem and even beyond. Luke, who we're reading from the Gospel of Luke this morning, is the, the same one who wrote the book of Acts. And he goes on to describe it like this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Where does it start? In our Jerusalem. Praise God. It's a journey Cleopas and his companion take. And it's a journey each of us has taken, is taking, or will take. And it begs some questions for us to consider. That are, are, we, are we leaving Jerusalem? Are we in Emmaus? Are we on the way? Are we returning to Jerusalem? Where are you at right now with God? In what ways has your life been shattered? Did it feel like it's been in pieces? Maybe you're running. Maybe you've misunderstood your hunger as running. Maybe it's not running at all. Maybe there's hunger deep inside of you. What are you running toward? Will you tell other people about your Jerusalem experience? Your Emmaus Road revelation. See, there's no right or wrong answer to these questions. There's only your answer, whatever your answers may be, they describe the intersection of Jesus' life with your life. He wants to be the gold that brings your pieces back together. Let's pray. Our loving and heavenly Father, we think again on the sacrifice of Jesus the giving of his body and his blood, the sacrifice, 
exemplified in the breaking of the bread, the drinking of the juice, the way in which that speaks of his grace and new life to restore us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading us here today. For this very moment where we look back on seven days ago and we remember there's something very special that happened in order to be able to bring our broken pieces to wholeness. Not pretending that they don't exist, not pretending that they aren't painful, not pretending anything other than we come openly to say, Jesus, we need to be put back together. Would you put us back together? By the means of your grace, put us back together, restore us. And we know that at different times, life's gonna break some more pieces, but you're there constantly with us. You're there with us on the journey. Even when we don't recognize you, you're there with us. Forgive us for when we've, we've, we've just run away without realizing maybe what we're running toward or for. Let us stop in this moment, Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to those who are running, that He's always been there, that He's waiting. Reveal yourself, Jesus, I ask. Bring restoration. Bring us back to a place that once was a place of pain. Let it now be a place of joy. Let it now be a place of community. Let it now be a place of love. I don't understand how that can take place. I don't understand just how you can work in those places, but I neither do I understand the depths of your love and the depths of your grace, which my word, this word tells me I can't outrun. <laughs> There's no place I can go that you're not there, your loving presence. Nothing can separate us from your love. Bring us back into relationship. Bring us back into being made whole. Burn in our hearts afresh again. Come Holy Spirit, burn in our hearts. Light a new fire. The revelation of Jesus had burned deep and bright and deep in our hearts. Enough to be able to want to go and tell others, there's hope in your brokenness. I've experienced it. His name is Jesus. And perhaps for you this morning, you found yourself here at church for all manner of reasons. But this morning, it's a morning you can say, I want to recommit or give for the very first time my life to Jesus. do that very simply by confessing that you need the Saviour, you need His help, you need that gold to pull the pieces back together again and you realise you can't do it, you need Him and you can simply call on His name Jesus, I need you Jesus, forgive me for running away Jesus, forgive me for all the things I've done where I've ignored you or even simply I feel so shattered by the circumstance of life, nothing even to do with what I feel like I've done. I need you, Jesus. Come. And Jesus, would you not only forgive me of my sin, but would you bring restoration, wholeness and healing to my life this day? I put you in charge. I put you the master potter back into the place of bringing my pieces back together. And I look to you this day as my Lord and my Saviour. Come fill me with your Holy Spirit. I just got a picture then of <laughs> some lives just being restored, just coming back and that, that bowl that I had, you know, now it can hold things. The cracks don't leak. You can use the bowl. I felt like Holy Spirit just wants to pour a fresh in. Pour a fresh in. And if that's you this morning, just open your heart now. Holy Spirit, just come pour a fresh.
pour fresh into people's hearts. Fill the bowls up, Lord. Burn within. Fill the bowls up, Jesus. We ask it in your wonderful and precious name. Amen.